Uh, hi, I'm Brendan Marsh. I'm a PhD candidate in Professor Benjamin Lev's research group at Stanford University. Um, and today on Socratic Studios, we will be covering um, associative memory with quantum physics. Associative memory is just the ability to learn and be able to recognize arbitrary sets of patterns. Um, so this can take uh, many different forms and it's sort of uh, a very general idea, um, but it's sort of one of the basic tasks you think of in machine learning, where you think of these artificial neural networks or other system recognizing different images, being able to distinguish between dogs and cats and images and that kind of thing. Um, for the purpose of today, associative memory is just this ability to be given some pattern, whatever it may be, and then be able to recognize that pattern um, under some kind of imperfect conditions. But let's say you take your favorite picture by Van Gogh. Maybe it's Starry Night. Um, what happens if I take the picture of Starry Night and rip it in half? Um, your brain still says, oh, this is Starry Night by Van Gogh. It's just half of it's missing. Or what if instead I take some paint and splatter it all over in random places? Um, as long as I don't splatter too much, the brain can still figure out, oh, I think this is Starry Night. There's just a bunch of splatterings on it. Um, and sort of this process where you take something that sort of vaguely looks familiar and say, oh, I know what that is. This is actually this thing that I've seen before. Um, that's kind of what I mean by recognizing objects under imperfect conditions. Um, so this is, of course, something that our brains do very, very well. Um, we can recognize and store information about very many different types of objects and patterns in our life. Um, and we're able to recognize and associate those patterns with each other under all kinds of different circumstances. Um, for example, something as simple as your friend getting a haircut. Um, how does your brain know that it's still your friend and that it's not somebody else? They look different now. Um, so that's kind of a silly example, but this can actually become a challenging task in other contexts. And the way that our brain deals with it um, is pretty intriguing. And um, that's sort of the, uh, yeah, the context for associative memory. There's a really um, sort of well-known and basic model for how our brains can, can do this. Um, and it was, it was a model introduced in, in the 80s by a guy named J.J. Hopfield. Um, and he introduced a very sort of minimal and sort of simplistic model for how the brain might work in terms of some neurons being on or off with some connections between those neurons. Um, and despite the simplicity of his model, it actually did quite well at learning arbitrary binary patterns and being able to recognize those patterns. Um, and, and this model, which became known after him as the, the Hopfield Neural Network, um, it turned out to be really interesting, not just from a neuroscience perspective, but also got the interest of a lot of physicists and mathematicians um, working to understand it better or bit build it in uh, some kind of physical system. Um, and that's actually what our, our lab is, is working towards right now. Computers that are using associative memory um, fundamentally work similarly to normal computers in that um, the sort of language that they use is still this binary language of zeros and ones. So it has some large set of things we call neurons in this case, which can be on or off, and which we sort of associate with states zero or one, like in a normal computer. Um, and the way that these Hopfield networks work is that they take any given configuration of all the neurons in the network, so maybe we have three neurons, the first one is on, the first one, the second one is off, and then the third one is on again. To any kind of configuration like that, um, we give that configuration some energy. Um, and so the way that Hopfield neural networks work is that they give each possible configuration of the system some energy, and they make it such that the, the things that the neural network has learned, so the patterns that have we've sort of internalized, those are the states with the lowest energy of the system. Um, so when you think about Hopfield networks, I find it kind of useful to think about sort of like a landscape, like maybe you're out in nature and there's mountains and valleys, and there's sort of pinpoints on all of these places in nature, and they each have some latitude. 
Um, the things that the neural network has learned correspond to the lowest points in this, in this landscape that we're in. Um, so those would be like the valleys. And the way that it recalls these memories, starting from some imperfect state, um, is just to go downhill in that energy landscape to the nearest um, low point. So maybe in the case of me splattering paint onto Van Gogh, that means instead of starting out in some point which corresponds to a, the lowest part of the energy landscape, you're starting out from some other point on the energy landscape, maybe on the slope of a mountain. And then to find that, oh, this is actually starry night, I just need to go downhill in this energy landscape until I hit some, some bottom point, some, some minimum point. Um, and that's very, um, very generally how the, how the neural networks work. Mostly because um, it's hard to make these energy landscapes. Um, and sort of the, the easiest way to do it is just in a computer where you have sort of full access over, full control over everything. So you just, you code it up in C or Python or your favorite programming language and you can directly say, this is the energy function that I want for the system and this is how it should update itself. And that's sort of a very natural task that you can do with, with programming. Um, and it's a very efficient one because computers are very fast. Um, but there, there certainly is interest in building these types of neural networks in physical systems, something rather than just your computer coming up with some sort of set of objects that naturally follow these rules and naturally implement these energy functions. Um, and that's actually what we're studying in our laboratory is um, what happens when we try to engineer one of these hot field neural networks in a system um, which sort of naturally implements everything we need. And the interesting part for us is what happens when quantum physics is involved in this process as well. Um, so our, our big motivating question is to ask whether quantum physics can improve a hot field neural network's ability to learn memories or recall them better. Um, so well, we're kind of in the midst of a, a, a quantum revolution right now. Um, sort of the quantum computing age is, is coming upon us very quickly, but it's still young and we're still learning a lot. And I think um, quantum computing in general hasn't really worked out as simply as it could have. It's, um, there are a lot of roadblocks we're facing. And so we're trying to explore different ways in which quantum physics might help us in various types of computational tasks. And so a very big picture, that's what we're trying to study. So our, our method of implementing this, this hop field neural network um, is to, instead of using computers with some binary zero or one variables, um, the role of the neurons in our system is played by very cold atoms. So what, what our lab really is, is a, a quantum optics lab, meaning we, we study the, the quantum nature of light and we study how it interacts with matter. And we do that in all different kinds of ways, including this sort of hot field neural network project. And um, the way that the, the experiment we're envisioning here works, which we're building right now actually, is that we set up some network of cold atoms. The, the atoms mostly need to be cold just so that we can uh, keep them in one place and not have them fly around too much. Um, so so what it means to be cold, um, very generally, is that you have very low kinetic energy, meaning you're not moving very quickly. Um, the real reason we need our atoms to be very cold is just so that um, we can effectively trap them with laser beams and keep them in specific positions between the two cavity mirrors. Um, because actually, if the atoms move around too much, it changes the form of the hot field energy landscape, which we don't want. We want it to be some fixed thing that we desire. Um, so we have to stop them from moving around too much to mess up the, um, so that they don't mess up the energy landscape. Um, so we trap very cold rubidium atoms, in our case, at various different locations in space. And this sets up a graph of different. Um, sort of nodes of our neural network. And these play the role of the neurons or of the binary variables. So each of these atoms 
we constrain to be in one of two states. So atoms in general have a lot of different states they can be in. So the, the electron can orbit around the nucleus in very many different ways. Um, but we isolate just two of those kinds of states. And we say that if the atom is in this kind of state, then that corresponds to the on state, or the one. And if it's in this other kind of state, it's in the off state. And so we sort of map our atoms onto these um, binary digits that you'd find in a computer. And then the other part is that the atoms have to be able to talk to each other. They have to have some kind of interaction so that they can um, sort of to, sort of, to, de, to de, define the energy landscape that, um, that you need for a hot field neural network. And um, the way that the atoms interact through each other is through interaction with a very strong electromagnetic field. So these are, this is light. Um, so the way that we do that is we take our whole network of atoms and we wrap the whole thing between two mirrors, two sets of curved mirrors. So you have a curved mirror over here and a curved mirror over here. And the role of these mirrors is to trap light in between them. So um, one sort of simplistic way of thinking about light is as little balls called photons. So if you look very, very closely, um, you see that light behaves um, kind of like a particle and a wave at the same time. That's one of the very cool things about quantum mechanics. But a simple way of thinking about it is just that it's a little photon ball that bounces back and forth between these mirrors. Um, and the mirrors are very, very good. They only let a very, very small fraction of light through and mostly confine all of the light. And the, the reason we do this is that the light in the cavity um, basically creates interactions between the different atoms. So you have a, this network of atoms wrapped between two mirrors with a very, very strong electric field in between. So a very, very intense light. And this light mediates these interactions between our neurons of our system uh, in a way such that it mimics the energy landscape of a hot field neural network. And so we sort of have a similar notion of this energy landscape. Um, but the difference with our system is the way in which it navigates this energy landscape. Um, so with this heavy and learning rule, remember, we sort of, we make this energy landscape based off of thinking about overlap with the pattern states, and then we sort of use some dynamics to go down the energy landscape to a lowest point, and that's how we recall our memories. Um, what we have in our system is a lot more complicated. So the, the way that our system evolves in time and finds, and finds a memory is through these uh, dynamics generated by quantum physics. It's uh, in general pretty hard to simplify down to a simple sort of way of thinking about it. But um, Schrodinger's equation and the theory of open quantum systems dictates the sort of complicated ways in that the system evolves towards one of these states. Um, so in this case, what I mean by open quantum system is that actually our mirrors are not perfect. And every once in a while, a photon actually leaks out of our mirrors and escapes into the, the great unknown. Um, and that um, has an effect on the way that the system evolves in time. And it can't just be ignored. Describing how that works in an understandable way that we can um, understand, um, that's sort of one of our main challenges as, um, as physicists, not to mention building it. <laughs>
it's still capable of doing many things which we cannot imitate in the slightest. Like the, the full functioning of a human being combines so many senses all in parallel with each other, working at such an enormously fast rate with such an enormous amount of information flooding our senses all the time. Um, this is a task that really no computer could handle right now. Um, so certainly up until the point where computer systems can mimic humans to a very good degree, we'll always have a lot to learn from the human brain. Um, now, will we ever reach a point where we can no longer learn from the brain? That's a tough one. That one's a little philosophical. Can we ever fully really understand ourselves? <laughs> I don't know, but I think if it's the case, it won't be anytime soon. <laughs> I think that's my best answer for that one.